Now we come in chapter 2 here to another section, and actually it's still dealing with the priests, and they are reproved for profanity. They were profane, that is, profanity, phanus meant temple, pro before the temple, or against the temple. Actually, instead of serving God, they were opposed to God, disgracing God in the very service that they had in the temple. In other words, the crying sin of the priests was they despised the name of God. And second, they disobeyed God. They were in disobedience to God. Now, the way they despised his name, and I've dwelt on that a great deal, but I have not yet put the real emphasis there. I have mentioned the old sick cow that they brought and offered that as an offering to God. Now, the real condemnation of that was not the value of it. It was not because they were giving a valueless thing to God, and he was after them because they were not giving as they should. Now, we're going to come to that. He's going to ask a very pointed question, and the question is, will a man rob God? Now, we're going to talk about the tithe and about our relationship to God today as expressed in our giving. But here, the emphasis is not upon the value of the offering, but actually upon the character of the offering. The offering that was made on the altar, and when we studied Leviticus, we took those five great offerings that are mentioned there, and each one of them points to Jesus Christ. And the thing, I suppose, that would be more impressive than anything else is the character of the offering. Each offering had to represent the one who was coming, who was holy, harmless, undefiled, and separate from sin, who was perfect. He had to be, and it pointed to the one who was the Son of God. Even the sweet savor and the non-sweet savor offerings pointed to that. Now, the way they despise God's name is that they bring to God an offering that is a sick cow. It's not perfect, and it does not point to the Lord Jesus Christ. And that was the thing. And it's the same thing today of making a great deal of Jesus Christ, calling him a superstar. Well, the world can't forget him, that's for sure. But they don't think rightly of him. And until you think rightly concerning him, you just happen to be wrong about everything else because it's important. And when we don't think rightly of Jesus Christ and we put him down as he's been put down today in books and plays and even in the liberal pulpit, you despise the name of God. And that is the reason that we hear so much that's given in a flip sort of way like the devil made me do it. Well, the devil didn't make you do it. You got that old evil nature. The devil didn't make you do it. And the other one is, God will get you. No, he won't. Do you think he's running around today paddling little boys and girls? He is not. May I say to you, our God is a gracious God, and he judges sin, and he's going to judge sin he is called the awful God. Well, what do you mean? That's awe-inspiring. It means reverent. He is the reverent God. He is one to be respected. And he is to be praised. He is to be worshipped. He is to be adored. I listened on TV the other night to just snatches of box opera. And I think it's on a mass. But it was nothing in the world but praise to God. Now, I don't care. I understand mass doesn't mean anything, but I don't care whether it does or not. The important thing in that was that it was nothing in the world but pure praise to God. And we don't have much of pure praise to God 
even today in our so-called fundamental churches. And that's the thing. You despise my name, God says. And today, that is a condemnation of the church, and all believers are priests today, and so this makes a real message for us in the present hour. Now we've come here to this particular section where it's directed to the priests. However, beginning back at verse 6, if you will notice, the message there was directed to the priests that were serving in the temple. And there God said, O priests that despise my name. And then in this section, chapter 2, verse 1, He says, and now, O ye priests, this commandment is for you. If ye will not hear, and if ye will not lay it to heart, to give glory unto my name, saith the Lord of hosts, I will even send a curse upon you, and I will curse your blessings. Yea, I have cursed them already, because ye do not lay it to heart. In other words, they were not taking their office seriously. They are going to be judged, actually, more severely than the people. Why? Because of their place of responsibility. And they were permitting this sordid condition to exist, and they were shutting their eyes to the fact people were bringing these sacrifices of the lame and the sick to God. And God had given them the law of truth. And they were to serve in that way. They were to give out that message. I'll be very frank with you. I would rather be any person on top side of this earth. And will you hear me now? Because this is going to be a strong statement. I would rather be the worst sinner on this earth, whoever he might be, whether he's a gangster or a murderer or whatever he is. I'd rather be that sinner than to be a minister who goes into the pulpit and does not believe the Word of God and gives a pretense and puts on a performance and gives a few little pious platitudes. I would rather be the greatest sinner than to be that man because God is certainly going to hold that man responsible. May I say to you, Someone's going to say, that's too strong. Well, my friend, somebody needs to say that today. And I just happen to be the fellow that doesn't mind saying it. Now, here it's disobedience. It's disobedience. And now, O ye priests, this commandment is for you. But they've despised him. Now, I come down to verse 3. Behold, I will corrupt your seed. Now, what does he mean by that? Well, they were getting an abundant harvest at that particular time. And the priests, you remember, got a tithe of the crop, whether it was wheat or barley or whether it was the vineyard. A tenth was given to the Lord. And God says, I intend to corrupt the seed out there. You won't be getting the tithe that you have been getting. You're affluent society is about done with. Behold, I will corrupt your seed, and I'll spread dung upon your faces. Now, the interesting thing was that there was given to the priests all of the inwards of the offering. Even the maw was given to them. But the dung that was in the maw, in all intestines, that was put out. That was rejected. That could never be offered as a sacrifice to God. Therefore, God says, now I'm going to spread the dung on your face. And I want to tell you, friends, this is pretty plain language. God says, I'm going to rub your nose in it. And when I do, you won't be able to serve at my altar. Why? Because no unclean thing can come there, and you definitely will be unclean when that takes place. Let me tell you, this is strong language God is using here. And he says, even the dung of your solemn feast, and one shall take you away with it. In other words, you won't be able to serve God. Now, verse 4, 
And he says, And ye shall know that I have sent this commandment unto you, that my covenant might be with Levi, saith the Lord of hosts. Now, we're going to look in just a few moments at his covenant with Levi. But let me move on down. My covenant was with him of life and peace. And I gave them to him for the fear with which he feared me and was afraid before my name. The law of truth was in his mouth, and iniquity was not found in his lips. He walked with me in peace and equity and did turn many away from iniquity. Now, we have the reason that God chose the tribe of Levi. If you go back to the man, Levi, the son of Jacob, you'd never choose him because he didn't have anything to commend himself to God at all. And when old Jacob was dying, you remember, he called those 12 boys stand around his bedside, and he gave a prophecy concerning each one of them. And he put Simeon and Levi together. And I'm turning back to Genesis 49, beginning at verse 5. Listen to this. O Simeon and Levi are brethren. Instruments of cruelty are in their habitations, O my soul, come not thou into their secret, under their assembly. Mine honor be not thou united, for in their anger they slew a man, and in their self-will they dig down a wall. Now, they thought they were justified in it because of their sister, but they were murderers. And it's amazing God would choose them. And so verse 7, he says, Cursed be their anger, for it was fierce, and their wrath, for it was cruel, I will divide them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel. And how is he going to scatter Levi? They're going to become the priestly tribe. But how can they become the priestly tribe when Levi himself was such a rascal? He was a murderer. And yet God chose the tribe. Well, after that, from this man, there came one of the tribes of Israel. Now, when you come to the time of Moses... You've come to something entirely different. And Moses now, when he's on his deathbed, he gathers the tribes around me. What was just 12 men around Jacob now are probably a million or more, a million plus that are gathered around Moses. And he's giving a prophecy to each one of these. And this is found in Deuteronomy The 33rd chapter, verses 9, and let me begin reading there, 9 through 11. Who said unto his father, probably, I ought to drop back and begin at verse 8 so we'll know it's Levi. And of Levi, he said, let thy Thummim and thy Urim be with the Holy One, whom thou didst prove at Massa, and with whom thou didst strive at the waters of Meribah who said unto his father and to his mother, I have not seen him, neither did he acknowledge his brethren, nor knew his own children, for they have observed thy word and kept thy covenant. Now notice that. Although Levi himself was a rascal, and he almost forfeited his birthright because the fact he was a murderer, but now the tribe that has come from him, they've observed the word of God. They've kept the covenant. Verse 10, They shall teach Jacob thy judgments and Israel thy law. God now makes them the priestly tribe to teach Israel God's law. That is the thing he says. They shall put incense before thee. They'll make prayer for the children of Israel and hold burnt sacrifice upon thine altar. And that sacrifice points to Christ. Bless. Lord, his substance, and accept the work of his hands, smite through the loins of them that rise against him, and of them that hate him, that they rise not again. Now, that is the covenant God made with Levi. He is to teach Israel. He is to serve at the altar, altar of incense, prayer, altar of the burnt sacrifice, where that which points to Christ... Now, that was at the beginning. What about him now after the return? Why, he's willing to shut his eyes when a sick cow is brought, and he's despising the name of God. 
and he's disobeying God, and therefore how can he teach God's Word to the people? That is the thing that God is saying. Now, what a change has taken place. Even after the 70 years' captivity, Levi hasn't learned the lesson. He says, "...my covenant was with him of life and peace, and I gave them to him for fear, with which he feared me and was afraid of my name." He feared God. This crowd doesn't. The law of truth was in his mouth. He taught the truth of God. But these priests at that time were not teaching the truth of God. They were breaking the commandments of God instead of teaching them and keeping them. And that's the thing that God is saying now. And God says, He walked with me in peace and equity and did turn many away from iniquity. He was a good example, you see, to the people. Now, what a change had taken place. Now, this has a real application today. My friend, may I say to you, we're not serving God until you and I give a reverence to his name and not despise his name. And that means that we'll hold Christ up. If I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto me. What a glorious, wonderful picture that is that we have here. Now, I want to move down to verse 7. For the priest's lips should keep knowledge, and they should seek the law at his mouth, for he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. And here again, we have that word angel. And Levi here, that is, the priests are to be the messengers of the Lord of hosts. Now, when we get to Revelation, we'll see to the angel of the church in Ephesus. Who's he speaking to? The leader there, the one who is teaching the Word of God. And that is the thing that is important. Let me sum this up now by saying this. This is my judgment, my interpretation of this. You may not accept the interpretation, but I believe that the sole duty of the pastor of the church is to teach the Word of God. And God have mercy on a church that is having him become a public relations man, having him run all over the countryside seeing sick babies and burping them, and have him spend his time in administration of a church when he should be studying the Word of God and teaching the Word of God. I had a call from back east the other night. And this man, he's an officer in the church, telling me about his church and his pastor. And my, believe me, he was after his pastor. And his pastor spends his time studying. And he says, you know, said, he's not administering the church. I said, did you tell me you were a deacon? He said, yes. I said, have you been visiting the sick yourself? He said, no, says, I keep pretty busy. And I said to him, do you know I said that's your business? And are you visiting the sick? Are you today taking charge of the administration of the church as you should? Or you want him to be the administrator? May I say to you, brother, his business is to teach the Word of God. Now, if he's not teaching the Word of God and he gets in the pulpit, then that's another story. But if he's spending his time studying, and is giving out the Word of God, that's what God has called him to do. That's the thing. Remember the early apostles. Here were the widows of the Hellenic Jews and those that were native in that land, been born in that land. They were arguing, the widows, of the distribution of the gifts that were coming in that would feed them. And they brought it to the apostles. My apostles did a marvelous job. They said, you point a bunch of deacons. Let them do this. We're going to give ourselves to the study of the Word of God. That is the important thing today. Now, I'm at a very great vantage point today. I've completed my ministry in the church, and I'm at the place now where, you know, you give advice to the other preachers because you're through. I'm at a tremendous vantage point to say this, and I do say it. And I thank God that I'm in a place now where I don't have to burp babies. That's not my business anymore. 
I do not have anything to do. Well, I have a little to do with administration, but that's not where I spend my time. I am spending more time today studying the Word than I have ever spent, and I thank God for it. And if I went back over my ministry, I'd even spend more time than I did. And some of them thought I spent too much time studying. But I'd go back and spend more time studying. I believe that's the business. That was Levi's business. But in this day, he wasn't doing it. Now, God says, "...but ye are departed out of the way, ye have caused many to stumble at the law." You have corrupted the covenant of Levi, saith the Lord of hosts. You're not teaching the Word of God as you should. That's verse 8. Now, verse 9. Therefore have I also made you contemptible and base before all the people, according as ye have not kept my ways, but have been partial in the law. There was a day when ministers were listened to in this land. That day's past. Only the liberal has a voice on TV, and thank God they don't have radio monopolized by any means. And there are few good voices on TV. But for the most part, especially when it's a program on which men are asked to appear, it's always the liberal that's asked to appear. Why? God said that that would happen when the ministry was not giving out the Word. Now, friends, we've come down here in chapter 2 to verse 10. And here now, the people are rebuked for social sins. And it had to do here with the family. He says in verse 10, "...have we not all one Father?" Now, there are many that try to say that he means Abraham because he's speaking specifically to Israel and definitely to Judah. And since that is true... There have been those, and maybe with some justification, they have said it's Abraham. But I think the next question makes it clear that he's speaking about God. Hath not one God created us? Now, he also makes it clear how God is the Father. God is a Father by creation. But man lost that. Adam was a son of God. But... After the fall, he begat a son in his likeness, not the likeness of God, but in the likeness of his fallen nature. And so when you come to the nation Israel, you do not find God speaking specifically of individual Israelites as being sons, but he speaks of the corporate body that's in the nation, or the nation Israel as his son, Isaiah says, Israel, my son. Well, that's the nation, not just one individual. Even of two men that were so outstanding in the Old Testament, like Moses and David, it's Moses, my servant. David, my servant. Never Moses, my son, or David, my son. We become sons of God through faith in Jesus Christ. Have we not all one Father? That's by creation. We're all human beings. Now, that is something that is being greatly emphasized in the world today, and I think properly so. We're all human beings. I heard a man, definitely an unsaved man, on TV play that up, that we're all human beings, and we ought to show respect one for another and consideration. Well, that's true. As far as he went, that's entirely accurate. You're a human being. I'm a human being. And I should accord you the same rights, privileges, and respect that I would like to have for myself. Have we not all one Father? Hath not one God created us? We are all the creation of God. Why do we deal treacherously every man against his brother, by profaning the covenant of our fathers. Now, here they were, a chosen people, and they are breaking God's covenant, and they were dealing treacherously one with another. And not right with God, they're not right one with another. And that is certainly true of man today. I very personally have to say that a great many people that are unsaved today... I 
couldn't trust them. I wouldn't trust them. And unfortunately, I have to say, since I've been in the church for most of my life, there are a lot in the church that I would not trust, nor have I any confidence in them all. Why? They deal treacherously. And there is nothing that hurts the cause of Christ today more than a church fight and difficulty in the church and the fact that believers are at each other's throats, how tragic that is. And I don't care how evangelistic the church might be. The witness is nil when they are at each other in a very terrible fight. He goes on here in verse 11, and he's very specific now. Judah hath dealt treacherously. We now know who he's talking about, the tribe of Judah and around Jerusalem. He says, Judah hath dealt treacherously, and an abomination is committed in Israel. Now, that's all the twelve tribes. And in Jerusalem, the capital, for Judah hath profaned the holiness of the Lord, which he loved. Now, God is holy, and he loves holiness. God doesn't love sin. He hates sin. Now, specifically, what's he talking about? And God will always spell it out. And hath married the daughter of a foreign god. Now, we've dealt with that. They were leaving their wives, and around them were these beautiful foreign girls, and they were marrying them. But these girls served a heathen pagan deity. And that brought into Israel, that brought idolatry into the nation. That's the way it got in at the beginning. That's the way that Balaam was able, actually, to curse Israel. He could not curse them. God would not permit it. But he was able to give Balak some very bad advice for Israel. He said, let the daughters of Moab marry the sons of Israel. And again, it brought judgment of God down upon them. And that, my friend, is something that carries all the way through the Word of God. And personally, I think that's what the six of Genesis means. I don't think that men and angels cohabited and produced some kind of a monstrous offspring because angels neither marry, they're given in marriage. And what you have here is a godless line, the sons of God. The godly line looked upon the daughters of man. And again, it's the same old story. And it's the same old story today. I've been saying it in Southern California since 1940. And I get out of breath saying it, but I keep on saying it. And divorce keeps building up. Nobody's paying any attention to me. But I keep saying it, a believer and an unbeliever ought not to get married. Any girl or any boy that flies in the face of God's very definite, specific instructions and command in this connection is just flirting for trouble. And believe me, problems will be coming his way. And it always happens that way. It cannot be otherwise. Now, verse 12 The Lord will cut off the man that doeth this, the master and the scholar. Doesn't make any difference who he is. Out of the tabernacles of Jacob and him that offering an offering unto the Lord of hosts. You see, it doesn't make any difference whether he's going through the ritual if he continues to live in sin. That's the reason that the prodigal son was a son and not a pig. He one day said, I'm going to go home to my father. My father's not a pig. My father's up yonder in that beautiful white house, and I want to go home, have the nature of my father. And a child of God won't live in sin. Now, this man, I read that startling letter today, says I'm an officer in the church and I can't give up adultery. My brother, whoever you are, and he's signed it here. I'm not giving any names or any places other than it's Southern California in the Los Angeles area, and that could take in so many that there's no reason why I shouldn't identify the geographical place. If you are God's child, you're going to get out of the pig pen. And if you don't get out of the pig pen, 
There's just one conclusion to come to. You just have to be one of the pigs, because nothing but pigs love the pig pen and are satisfied to stay down there. You'll get out of it. Now notice verse 13. And this have ye done again, covering the altar of the Lord with tears, with weeping and with crying out, insomuch that he regardeth not the offering any more, or receiveth it with good will at your hand. Well, what was happening? The wives of these men that were divorcing them and going and marrying these foreign girls, these wives came to the altar weeping and in tears, and shed them upon the altar, you see. God said, I heard them. I listened to them. And then when you came along later and very piously, and you brought your offering and put it on that same altar where the tears of your wife was, then you expected me to accept it. God says, I want you to know something. I didn't pay any attention to it. And I would say this. I have a notion that this man that says he's an officer in the church, and he commits adultery. I have a notion he takes up the offering. He may be the treasurer of the church. He may be the head deacon. But God is paying no attention to your work. It's no good in his sight. It'd be better if you stayed home and stayed out of sight. God makes it very clear here. God says he will not receive it at all. God says, I will not receive it with goodwill at your hand. I know you're a hypocrite, and I will not accept it. Well, what did they do? Well, he makes it very clear. He spells it out. Judah hath dealt treacherously. He's not talking to the priests now, but to the people. He's talking to the people. This is a sin that the people have committed that came back into that land. Judah hath dealt treacherously. And an abomination is committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. For Judah hath profaned the holiness of the Lord, which he loved, and hath married the daughter of a foreign god. In other words, a heathen woman, a pagan woman, that was worshiping in idolatry. Now, that's the way idolatry got into the northern kingdom, was through Ahab marrying Jezebel. And she was the daughter of the high priest of Baal over in Sidon. She was a Sidonian. And that was the way it came in. Now, that was happening again. You see, these people have returned to the land and around them. We learned that from Nehemiah. Well, there were all kinds of people that were living around them at that time. And an Israelite, and he'd be married, and he'd see some good-looking, you know, beautiful foreign girl. And he decided that he would like to have her for his wife. So he'd get rid of his wife, and he would marry this foreign girl. Now, let me keep reading down here, and I'll come to the verse that we're after. Verse 12, I'm reading, "...the Lord will cut off the man that doeth this, the master and the scholar, out of the tabernacles of Jacob, and him that offereth an offering unto the Lord of hosts. And this have ye done again." covering the altar of the Lord with tears, with weeping, with crying out, insomuch that he regardeth not the offering any more, or receiveth it with good will at your hand. Now, will you notice as we move on here, verse 14, Yet ye say, Why? Oh, will you listen to him? With feigned, injured innocence, with pretended ignorance, offense. Oh, God is so offensive to even suggest that, because why wouldn't he accept it? Why, well, I brought a lovely, nice little fat lamb to offer, but God says you're rotten in your life. And may I say that when they ask the question why, now God spells it out so you can't misunderstand. He puts it in neon lights. Because the Lord hath been witness between thee and the wife of thy youth against whom thou hast dealt treacherously, yet is she thy companion and the wife of thy covenant. Now, she is the one that you stood before the priest and took a covenant that you would be faithful and true unto her. You see, he married a Hebrew girl when he was a young man, gets a little older, and he 
moves out, that is, in his travels, out among these pagan heathen. And what happens? He's a witness now between thee and the wife of thy youth, against whom thou hast dealt treacherously. Yet is she thy companion and the wife of thy covenant. In other words, they had been married, and it was a religious ceremony, not a civil. They were joined together by the priest. Verse 15, and this is the important verse, "...and did not he make one? Yet had he the residue of the Spirit, and why one?" Now, that has always been a difficult passage to interpret. And I rather think that Dr. Feinberg is quite accurate when he says here that the natural interpretation that the prophet is speaking here of divorce and the reference here is to the original institution of marriage by God himself. And we're going to see that, where God made them one. When he was married to that girl in the time of his youth, God made them one. And did not he make one, yet had he not residue of the Spirit, and why one? That he might seek a godless seed. Therefore take heed to your spirit, and let none deal treacherously against the wife of his youth. You see, putting her aside, divorcing her, and marrying others. Now, this takes you back to creation. Malachi takes you back to creation. And the Lord Jesus in the 19th of Matthew took them back to creation. Paul took them back to the creation of man and woman. There you find God's original purpose. The woman was a help that was to be fit for the man. She's to be one that's part of him. He's not a man without her. Adam didn't know he was a man till Eve was brought to him. Then he knew he was a man, and he knew she was a woman. And she knew he was a man, and she knew she was a woman. They were one. Each was a half of the other. And when a man and a woman can reach the place and say, as you have it in the Song of Solomon, I am my beloved, and my beloved is mine. My friend, when a man and a woman can say that, they've arrived. That's a happy home. That's a glorious relationship. And that is God's intention and God's purpose. Now, the other day I referred to some talks that a very fine Christian medical doctor, a family physician over in Springdale, Arkansas, has made. All I can say is this, that I have listened to these tapes. And as I listened to them, I wish that before I got married, and I thought I was a young fellow that knew it all, I'd been in the world, I thought I had all the answers, but when I listened to these tapes, I found out I didn't know anything. I was an innocent abroad, let me say, an innocent lost in the woods. And I think that's true of a great many. And if you're a young married couple, and you really sincerely, want to know what God has for you in marriage and in the sex relationship. Dr. Ed Wheat has done, and he's in Springdale, Arkansas. A young man or a young woman that's engaged are planning to get married, a young married couple, you will find these tapes absolutely invaluable and discussed in the frankest way you've ever listened to it but by a Christian physician in a way that nobody can snicker or laugh or ridicule. This is something, it's the first time I've ever recommended anything like this because I've never felt that the church should get into this field at all. But here is something you can't pass by. Now, let me continue on here. God said he made them one. He made them one. Made them one in the child, you see. Adam is a half, and Eve is a half, and together they made one. And believe me, before they got through, they had pretty much populated one spot on this earth, let me tell you. And did not he make one? Yet had he the residue of the Spirit? And why one? That he might seek a godless seed. You see, she had to be a help to him. 
She had to be like his. And that's the reason, young lady, you ought not to marry that young man unless he believes as you do. Because actually you're supposed to go his way. And you're going to find the going rough if you're a child of God. And young man, and our young woman, you may think you can win them over after you get married. Don't you know that before you get married, that's when you have your greatest influence? I tell you, a young fellow in love, he'll just do anything to please the girl he's going to marry. But you wait till after he's married a while, he may not be so anxious to please her. So that if you can't win him before, you won't win him afterward. And you're in trouble. And I mean deep trouble. And did not he make one? Yet had he the residue of the Spirit? And why one that he might seek a godly seed? For the sake of the family, in a home where there's divorce or where there was polygamy in the past, it's not a fit place to raise children. It's a difficult place. Therefore, take heed to your spirit. Let none deal treacherously against the wife of his youth. Now, God says, that was the one that I honored, and you have no right to break it on sinful grounds. That is, marrying these foreign women. To begin with, God had forbidden that. God specifically had put down His Word, the law. They were not to marry out among the heathen. And you remember Nehemiah, when we studied Nehemiah? Nehemiah, after he'd built the walls of Jerusalem, he had to return to his job back down in Media Persia, the capital. He served the king down there as cupbearer. But after he'd been down there for a while, he got a vacation. He came up. And he found that old Tobiah, the enemy of God, had moved into the temple. They'd cleaned out a storeroom, and the high priest had made an apartment for him because his son had married the daughter of old Tobiah. And you know what Nehemiah did? Nehemiah went in and pitched out all of his belongings and even the furniture and told him to take off. And you say, that's pretty rough and not very polite. No, but sure did cleanse the temple. I wish to God we had laymen today that stood for the Word of God like that. This is terrific, friends. Now, what was God's ideal for man? And I'd like now to turn to Genesis, the second chapter, verse 20. The Lord Jesus says, From the beginning it was not so. God never intended to have divorce. But because of man's sin, it is permitted. And somebody says, well, divorce is sinful. Sure it is. So is murder. But a murderer can get saved. In fact, one was dying on the cross next to Jesus. And he was saved. He was a thief also. Thief can get saved, and a divorced person can get saved. And this idea that when a person has been divorced and then gets saved, that they can't marry again. My friend, if they've committed murder or, or a thief, they can get saved and can marry again if they got the divorce before they were saved. And I think that's the thing that the Lord Jesus Christ certainly inferred. But now let's turn back. Genesis 2, 20. And Adam gave names to all cattle and to the fowl of the air, to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a help meet for him. Well, actually... Among all the creation of God that was beneath man, none could take the place of what became later a wife. In other words, God created all other creatures by two. Now that which is above man, angels, certainly man could not find a mate among them. So man's pretty much alone. And I think God let Adam go through a long period of being alone, to let him know that he needed somebody there, that only half of him had been really created at the beginning. Now, will you notice, he needs a help that's meat for him. No animal can take the place, and no angel can take the place, but he needs somebody like he is, and yet different. One that can help that's meat for him means a help that's fit for him. One that fits in. He's just a half, and you need another half to be put there together so they can be one. And that was the thing that God had in mind. 
And that's the way God created them like that. I get a little provoked today of hearing so many people act as if sex is really something that is still bad, that sort of thing. It's wrong when it's taken out of marriage because, after all, who was it that thought of sex? God's the one that thought of it, friend. He's the one that made man and woman. And this is a marvelous arrangement, by the way, that he had in mind. Verse 21, And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. Why did God do that? Why didn't he take her from the ground as he had Adam? Because she'd be different. She's to be like him. And so she must come from man, because man is not a whole person, really. And he takes him from a rib. And as someone has said, he didn't take Eve from his head to be his superior, nor from his foot to be his servant, but from his side to be his equal and to be with him. And the Scripture knows nothing about this idea of either women's lib or the inferiority of women. What a high plane they are put on. And this passage that we're looking at back in Malachi, and we've got pretty far from it now, but that passage reveals the high plane women were held on, how God protected them in that day. He says, you sinned against me when you sinned against the wife of your youth. Now he goes on, he says, and the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. He made her Ishai. Man was Ish, Ishai, just the other half of man. She must have been a beautiful thing. And God brought her and gave her to man. And I want to tell you, there's a marriage that God made and God blessed. There's a marriage made in heaven. And it's going to work. Now let's go back and see what Moses said way back when he gave the granting of divorce. And this is Deuteronomy, the 24th chapter, verse 1. When a man hath taken a wife, married her, and it come to pass that she find no favor in his eyes because he hath found some uncleanness in her. He finds out she's not a virgin. He finds out he's been deceived. Why, that would be grounds for divorce. Then let him write her a bill of divorcement and give it in her hand and send her out of his house. And I take it that was the ground. And they had made it so broad that if she burnt the toast, that would be grounds for divorce back in the days, and many of the rabbis were teaching that, just the slightest whim. But Moses didn't mean that. Moses meant if he found some uncleanness in her. She's not a virgin. She's not what she claimed to be. In other words, he'd been taken in. That would, of course, lead to trouble in the home, lead to fighting. Someone has said that puppy love always leads to a dog's life anyway. Well, let me read on. Verse 2, and when she is departed out of his house, she may go and be another man's wife. And if the latter husband hate her and write her a bill of divorcement, and she must have be or something, if two of them are going to reject her, and write her a bill of divorcement and giveth it in her hand and sendeth her out of the house, or if the latter husband die, which took her to be his wife, her former husband, which sent her away may not take her again to be his wife. After that, she's defiled, for that's an abomination before the Lord. Thou shalt not cause the land to sin, which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance. In other words, that would be progressive prostitution. And you have that sort of thing today. We have them in Hollywood. I've heard of one recently that's been married and divorced seven times. Well, that's just progressive prostitution That's all that is. That's absolutely to ridicule the marriage vow altogether. Now, that problem which was prevalent in Israel at that time is prevalent in our contemporary culture. And we've certainly changed our viewpoint in recent years on this. And I suppose that divorce is one of the most controversial questions that any Bible preacher has to answer today. There's confusion as to what the Bible really says on this problem. And there is great difference and wide divergence of interpretation at this. In other words, friends, 
if I may use the common colloquialism of the street, this is a hot potato. And I want to say, first of all, that you cannot say that there are no grounds for divorce. I'm of the opinion that that is a position that's always been untenable, and that is the position that the church, a hundred years ago, would have taken 100% in spite of what the Word of God had to say. Now, the Lord Jesus made very clear two things. One was that Moses had permitted divorce because the hardness of the people, but that there was one clear-cut basis for divorce, and that was fornication. That is, unfaithfulness on the part of either the man or the woman. Now, I'm turning, of course, to that familiar passage now, Matthew 19, verse 3. Will you listen? The Pharisees also came unto him, testing him, and saying unto him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? And he answered and said unto them, Have ye not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? And said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother, and he shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh." And he goes back to the original creation of man and woman. And that, my friend, is where we need to go to today, and we'll be going there in just a few moments. Now he says in verse 6 here of Matthew 19, "...wherefore they are no more twain, but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder." They say unto him, Why did Moses then command to give a writing of divorcement and to put her away. He saith unto them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, in other words, because of the cold, callous, sinful nature of man, divorce was permitted. And our Lord qualifies that. He suffered you to put away your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. Moses had made a broad basis for divorce, by the way. Now, verse 9, "...and I say unto you, Whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery, and whoso marrieth her which is put away, doth commit adultery." And it's quite interesting how the disciples followed up on that. And they said, if the case of the man be so with his wife, it's not good to marry, if it's that strict. And he said unto them, all men cannot receive this saying, save they to whom it's given. And then he put down the liberty that we have, for there are some eunuchs which are born from their mother's womb. There are some men, some women, don't need to marry. It's not necessary for them to get married. It's not a sin to be single by any means. And he says, and there are some eunuchs which are made eunuchs of man. Daniel was one, and that was a custom in that day, especially in the harems. And they were made that, but that was done forcibly. And there be eunuchs which have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. And there are men that for some cause to serve Christ, to serve the church, have made themselves eunuchs. And if a man can do that and feels that's the way he should be led, I've known several preachers that have never married. I attempted in my ministry to follow one like that, and I decided I'd be an old bachelor all my life. I soon found out that wasn't for me. This is an area in which you have great liberty. But the important thing, Christ said that there was one ground, and that was fornication. Now, Moses had made it pretty wide, as we're going to see in just a moment. Now, Paul apparently makes it clear that this matter of fornication is covered in a problem that came up in the Corinthian church. And I'm going to turn to 1 Corinthians, the seventh chapter, and I wish I could deal with all of it, and I have, and that is on cassette tape and is available to anyone that wants to see it in detail. I take the position Paul had been married, his wife probably had died, and he did not get married again. And I think this passage 
makes it clear. He says that if a man finds he should marry, well, then he should marry. That's the point. Now he says, verse 10 of 1 Corinthians 7, "...and unto the married I command, yet not I, but the Lord, let not the wife depart from her husband." That is, when she's married to an unsaved man. When they married, they were both pagan and heathen, and she got converted. And it could be the other way around. The man would get converted. And he says, "...but and if she depart, let her remain unmarried." or be reconciled to her husband, and let not the husband put away his wife. Now, because he gets saved, and his wife is not saved, is not a reason for putting her away at all. That is, provided he didn't marry an unsaved person when he was saved. But to the rest speak I, not the Lord. If any brother hath a wife that believeth not, and she be pleased to dwell with him, let him not put her away. Now, the pagan woman would say, well, I'm not a Christian as you are. If you want to go and meet with the Christians, that's fine. I love you, and I want to stay with you. And Paul says that arrangement is all right. And he says, verse 14, for the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the un Believing wife is sanctified by the husband, else were your children unclean, but now are they holy. But if the unbelieving depart, let him depart. I would assume that he means if the unbelieving wanted to leave and say, I don't like this arrangement, and leaves, whether he goes out and gets married or not, or she goes out and gets married or not in a situation like this, I would assume that the man or woman would be free to marry again. Let me drop down to verse 15 again. But if the unbelieving depart, let him depart. A brother or a sister is not under bondage. What bondage? The marriage vow in such cases. But God hath called us to peace. And I believe that that simply means this, that God has never asked any man or woman to live in a hell in a home. Never when they're fighting like cats and dogs and can't get along and find that out, I think they're to separate. I've advised on several occasions them to separate, but neither one of them to remarry. Even sometimes a Christian can't get along with another Christian. They get married and find out they fight like cats and dogs. And the problem is not divorce. The problem is marriage. There are a lot of people that are getting married ought not to get married. Here in Southern California, the divorce is just about equal to marriages. And I don't know what's going to happen when divorces pass the marriages. That's going to be something if that takes place. But the important thing is that God has called us to peace. Therefore, a home is not a boxing ring. It's not a place for jujitsu. It's not a place for karate. It's a place for love, if you please. Now, I'm reading, "...and did not he make one," that is, a man and a woman, "...yet had he the residue of the Spirit, and why one, that he might seek a godly seed? Therefore take heed to your spirit, let none deal treacherously against the wife of his youth." Now, God says that he has rejected all their offering because of the fact They were wrong in the family. They had put aside the wife of their youth in order that they might marry these heathen women, and that was the purpose of it. The Lord Jesus put down one very definite, specific reason for divorce. And that reason, as well as any others, because of the hardness of the hearts of men and women, because of sin that's entered the world. And then Paul makes it clear that when a believer and unbeliever... Now, you see, the Lord Jesus was not speaking into that situation. He's speaking to a people who were all of the same race, all supposed to be worshiping the same God. But now, Paul said, for the benefit of the Corinthians, because some of you over there got converted and you were already married, what should you do? Well, if the unbeliever will stay with you and you can make a home where there'll be peace and happiness, 
continue. But if that's impossible and the unbeliever walks out on you, then you're not bound. And for that reason, divorce would be permitted. Now, this passage in Malachi is the longest passage that you have in the Old Testament on the subject of divorce. God made not a broad basis for it under the law, as we looked at that in Deuteronomy 24. Actually, what he was doing there was making a basis that if a man found uncleanness, and I actually believe that when you say man, it's generic. It could be the man or woman with the wife would find uncleanness in the husband. Now, you have here something that I think today has been neglected. And the important thing is, the thing that's wrong is not the getting of a divorce. So much today as it's the fact that they're getting married. That is, those that are getting married who ought not to be married at all. Now, in this connection, I have a letter that came from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And I want you to hear this because it's marriage that has to be made right or the divorce naturally is the thing that's in the future. They ought not to get married. It's not that they ought not to get a divorce. I'm reading. I was able to listen to your broadcast for the first time in months today. What a tremendous blessing. I never thought I'd miss that southern rasp until the station you were on was canceled. And I want you to know that that's not a southern rasp. I ought to correct that immediately. That is that pure language that Zechariah talks about that in the millennium they're going to speak. So you're hearing that accent. All right. Then she tells about one station went off. That is, it was canceled, even the station. But we went on another station, and at first she didn't know that. I'm reading, Now I owe you an apology for my stupid behavior. Your broadcasts in media, or media, I'm not sure how it's pronounced, Pennsylvania was canceled like a nitwit. I wrote to the FCC and told them they were dummies for canceling the station. I wrote to you complaining and asked that other listeners write to the FCC. How very foolish. The Lord has shown me something I never would have learned without being deprived of his word through the broadcast. I was given a hunger, a deep, deep hunger for the knowledge only found in the word of the living God. One night at 2 a.m., I woke up my husband, shared with him my hunger for Christ. You see, I only thought I knew Christ, but I hadn't let him take control. After we prayed, I was flooded with a peace beyond description. Our marriage is so very dear now, all because of Christ. My husband accepted Christ when he was seven years old. I can't begin to tell you all the blessings we received together since that night. When the Lord gives to his children, he does it bountifully. Jesus is so very precious, my heart is filled with thanksgiving for your broadcast. Now, let me say this. You see that it's the marriage that is the important thing. And you can't correct certain situations when it starts out wrong. The Lord Jesus went back to it, and Paul refers to it. And here in verse 15, Malachi goes back to it. And did not he make one? That is, he made one. Adam and Eve were one. And that's important for us to see. Now we saw there was no help that was meet for Adam. He had no help from the underworld, that is, the animal world beneath him. And certainly he could not find a companion among angels. Now God took from Adam, as we saw, a rib, and this is not some foolish story, but why didn't he make woman out of the ground as he made man? Because of the fact he wants to impress upon man that woman is part of man. Man is only half a man without a woman, if you please. And that is the picture that you have. And as we said, she wasn't taken from his head to be his mental superior. She's not taken from his feet in order to be a servant. She's taken from his side 
She's to be a companion. She's to help him. They together are going to become one. Now, how will one plus one equal one? And that's God's arithmetic, by the way, and it's accurate. Verse 23 now of chapter 2 of Genesis. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman. What's woman? Well, Adam was Ish. She is Isha. Just the other side. We call them male and female. But it's just the other half of him, the other part of him. This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife. This, may I say, excommunicates mother-in-laws and father-in-law. This removes them from the new family. And I'm not going into that today, but I'm afraid that a great many folk are getting some very wrong instruction because there's one thing about marriage is it establishes a new creation and it has nothing to do with papa and mama. You've left them. And they shall be one flesh. Now, how are they going to be one flesh? Here's man and woman. Woman was taken out of man. Well, they're going to be one flesh in the child that is born. They're going to be one. And actually, what you've got here, one plus one plus one equals one. This is really a mathematical problem. Now, we're told here they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Now, this was before sin had entered into the world, and neither one would look upon the other in lust, because at that time they are innocent, but they see each other, and they know each other. And externally, they certainly knew each other. They did not look upon each other in a lustful manner. But here is a man and a woman, and he looked upon her with tenderness and love. That's exactly what Paul says in Ephesians. And she looked upon him in respect and love. In other words, she could truly say, this is the man for me. And the important thing is, the creation of Eve made Adam a man. And the presence of Adam made Eve a woman, all woman, all man. That's exactly what Paul over in Ephesians has a great deal to say about. And I want to turn to that passage also, because here's something else that is greatly misunderstood. And this has to do with not only a Christian home, but with believers who are spirit-filled. Because he begins all of this, be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Holy Spirit giving thanks and so on, speaking to yourselves in psalms and submitting yourselves one to another. Now he says, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. And that does not mean obey. He's not talking about obedience here at all. He's talking about she's to respond to man. She's the other part of man. But for the sake of headship, The husband is the head of the wife. Why? Well, because you have to have a head. This is not a monstrosity with two heads. Even as Christ is the head of the church, and he's the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their husbands in everything. And this is based on this. Husbands, love your wives. No wife is asked to become obedient to an alcoholic and to follow him to the bar room. If you think that's what Paul means, you're just entirely wrong. You ought to read it all. Husbands, love your wives. This is the kind of husband that she is to respond to. And it's my belief that a man is the one to say to the woman first, I love you. And when he says that, And she's to respond, I love you. And that leads me to say this. There's no such thing as frigidity in women. That is certainly 
misunderstood because if she has the right husband, she'll respond to the right man that gives her the right treatment and is her husband in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself to it. I believe young people today need lots more instruction than they're getting, and they don't need it in the public schools because the only thing that is glorified there is sex. I can recommend the medical doctor, a family doctor, over in Springdale, Arkansas, by the name of Dr. Ed Wheat. He's a personal friend of mine, and he has some cassette tapes that he has made as the advice He gives to young people, and it's one of the most thrilling that I've listened to, and I can recommend that very highly to young couples either going to get married or after they get married. Now, verse 16, "...for the Lord, the God of Israel, saith that he hateth putting away, for one covereth violence with his garment, saith the Lord of hosts." Therefore, take heed to your spirit that you deal not treacherously. One of the loveliest things in the Old Testament was that when a man married a girl, why, he took his garment, outer garment, and put it over her. That meant that he was going to protect her. You remember that lovely thing in the book of Ruth? Ruth was a widow. And according to the Mosaic law, she had to claim Boaz as her kinsman redeemer before he could act. He could not ask her to marry him. She had to claim him. And so Naomi, who was a regular matchmaker, sent her down there to the threshing floor. Says, now you go down there. And when that man, together, the whole families were there. They had had a big religious ceremony. Says, when he lies down, his feet sticking out from the wheat and all the other men lying around like spokes in the wheel protecting that pile of grain that was there that they'd thrashed. She says to her, you lie down there. And then when he waked up in the morning, he was cold, that desert country. He wanted to know who in the world it was that was way down there. Her feet stuck down toward his feet and his cloak was gone. And she said to him, put your cloak over me. In other words, she's asking him for his protection as the kinsman redeemer, in other words, to marry him. And that is what a man offers a woman in marriage, is his protection and his love. And she offers her devotion and her life to him. That's a picture of Christ in the church. Now, will you note, I'm going to begin today looking at this from a little different viewpoint than probably you've heard before because this does need to be emphasized in our day. And it's going to be the book that we're going to offer in Malachi. The title of it is The Best Love. Now, let me begin here. There is today an obsession with sex that's positively frightening and absolutely alarming. You need only to consult contemporary literature to recognize this. In a leading British paper not long ago, this statement was made. Popular morality is now a wasteland, littered with the debris of broken convictions. And it was Judge Barron of the Superior Court of Massachusetts who said, at too many colleges today, Promiscuity among students is a dangerous and growing evil. And then the Billy Graham paper decision had an editorial way back in 64, I guess it was. And by the way, these quotations go back that far. But here it is. So our young people go riding down the high road to hell in an atmosphere that would make any self-respect an animal sick to his stomach. And no one thinks that matters are as bad as they seem. And that is a tremendous statement and a good one, by the way. And an outstanding Christian writer in America says, But where are the compelling external cries to match the inner voices of the soul, which at times murmur darkly and other times clamorously 
that all is not well, that wayward feet are treading the way of wrath, the path of judgment. Then he goes on to say, the answer is not simply in passing more laws. It's to be found in regeneration by the Spirit who alone can set men's souls on fire with a divinely sent thirst for greater purity, both for the individual and for the body politic. Apart from such spiritual burning and purging, men sink beneath the weight and corruption of their own sin. Now, this goes back to about 1965, these quotations, but there are other voices being lifted in alarm. But all about us are the advocates of this erotic cult that falsely claim that all of this emphasis on sex is a signal of a new, broad-minded, and enlightened era. The facts are that there is nothing new about it. Furthermore, it does not mark the entrance upon abundant living. On the contrary, it's characterized the demise of all decadent and decaying civilizations. Egypt, Babylon, Greece, and Rome, to name but a few. The sex symbol marks the decline and fall of many a great and noble people. It's part of the death rattle of a fading nation. The French Revolution marked the departure of the glory of France. And it was during that time that a prostitute was placed on an altar in worship. The excuse for paying this abnormal attention to the subject given by these purveyors of filth and licentiousness is that a blue-nosed generation of the past put the lid down on it. The false charge is made that the Bible and the church have frowned upon the subject of sex until it's taboo today and can only be whispered in secret. They go on to place the blame of present-day marriage failures and the increase in divorce on the gross ignorance of young people. If they only knew more about this fascinating subject, this crowd counsels, there would be success in marriage. And may I add that this is the tragedy of it. It's true that our pilgrims and Puritans were blue-nosed. They were probably a little extreme. I'd certainly agree to that, and I wouldn't want to go back to that period. But this present generation hasn't found a solution to this at all. And after all, the Bible doesn't go with either crowd. I do not think that the Puritans had a Bible basis for it. As I said last time, who was it that thought of sex? It wasn't Hollywood, and it wasn't this crowd. They think they've originated it. God is the one that started all of this, my friend, and he wanted to put it on a holy basis. And this crowd, they play upon the fact that we Americans do not like censorship. And therefore, they should be free to say and publish what they choose. Well, these modern Pied Pipers of Hamlin are leading the younger generation into a moral morass of debauchery with dirty sex books and pornographic literature. They give the impression that you must be knowledgeable of this lasciviousness and salacious propaganda to be sophisticated and suave and sharp. You ought to know about Arthur Miller's death of a salesman and the Tropic of Cancer and Fanny Hill. The Bible of this group is Playboy magazine. These filthy dreamers have flooded the marketplace and the schoolroom today with this smut and depravity, so much so that a modern father said recently, it's not how much shall I tell my son, but how much does he know that I don't know? In spite of all this new emphasis on sex, the divorce courts continue to grind out their monotonous story of the tragedy of modern marriage in ever increasing number. Now, a knowledge of the physical may have its place in preparation for a happy marriage, but it is inadequate per se to make a happy home and it gives a perverted and abnormal emphasis which does not belong there. Dan Bennett, in a column recently, said, 
One of the troubles with the world is that people mistake sex for love, money for brains, and transistor radios for civilization. Well, that's the problem of the hour. Now, the Word of God treats the subject of sex with boldness and frankness and directness, as we have seen. It's not handled as a dirty subject, and it's not taboo nor theoretical, but it's plain and theological, if you please. The Bible is straightforward, and it deals with it in high and lofty language. And that's the reason we're spending time here with Malachi, because God lays it on the line for these people. And that's part of the reason they'd gone into captivity, and it's part of the reason they've been scattered. I think it's time, therefore, that God's heard. I feel that the pulpit is long overdue in presenting what God has to say on this subject but to keep it on the right plane. In the very beginning, it was God who created them male and female. It was God who brought the woman to the man. And I'd like to add this. He did not need to give Adam a lecture on the birds and bees. God blessed them, and marriage became sacred and holy and pure. And my friend, it's the only relationship among men and women that God does bless down here. He promises to bless no other. He says that if marriage is made according to his plan, he'll bless it down here, and there will be happiness. God wants his children to be happily married. He has a plan and purpose for every one of us if we'd only listen to him. Now, friends, I want to refer to a verse of Scripture here. That's Revelation 2.4. Nevertheless, I have against thee that thou hast left thy first love. Now, the church in Ephesus is the church at its best. It has never been on a higher spiritual level since then. It's difficult for us in this cold day of apostasy to conceive of the lofty plane to which the Holy Spirit had brought the early church in its personal relationship to Christ. The believers in the early church were in love with Christ. They loved him. And five million of them sealed their love with their own blood by dying as martyrs for him. I've made a little change, as you will notice, in the translation here of Revelation 2.4, and I want to make another change. The word for first love is proton in the Greek, and it means best. It's the same word that the Lord Jesus used in the parable of the prodigal son, so-called, where the father put on the son the proton robe, that is, the best robe. And to the Ephesian believers, Christ is talking about the best love. To the church on its high plane, into which a coolness was creeping, Christ says, Nevertheless, I have against thee that thou art leaving, not have left, but you're leaving your best love. Salvation is a love affair. The question that the Lord asks all of us is, do you love me? He's not asking, are you going to be faithful? Are you going to the mission field? Are you going to give? Are you going to do something? He's asking, do you love him? Then he'll tell you that you're to obey him and there'll be something for you to do. He's not asking, how much are you going to give? It's very clear. He said, if you love me, keep my commandments. And we love him because he first loved us. Now, the second book I ever wrote was on the little book of Ruth. My reason for writing it was to show that redemption is a romance. God took the lives of two ordinary people, a very strong and virile man and a very beautiful and noble woman, and he told their love story. In that story, God revealed to man his great love for him. It was a way to get this amazing fact through to us. Salvation is a love affair. In Christ's last letter to the Ephesian church, here in Revelation, he sounds a warning. We do not quite understand this, but I go back 30 or 40 years to his first letter to these believers written through Paul. We call it the epistle of Paul to the Ephesians. In this epistle... He discussed this matter of marital love and compared it to the love of Christ for the church. This has been one of the most misunderstood passages in the Word of God. Now, I gave it last time. Listen again today. 
Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. That's Ephesians 5.22. Now, there's been a natural resentment against this on the part of some, especially very dominant women, and that's gone on for years. And the women's lib would oppose it. But to resent this is to miss the meaning that is here. Submission is actually for the purpose of headship in the home. It's not a question of one lording it over the other. It's headship for the purpose of bringing order into the home. But in addition to this, it reveals something else that's quite wonderful. The husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is head of the church, and he's the Savior of the body. The analogy, you see, is to Christ and the church. Christian marriage down here, if it's made under the Lord, is a miniature of the relationship of Christ and the church. Christian marriage is an adumbration of that wonderful relationship between Christ and the believer. Christian marriage and the relationship of Christ and the church are sacred. Now, will you listen to me very carefully? The physical act of marriage is sacred. It's a religious ritual. It's a sacrament. I do not mean a sacrament made by the church, nor is it made by a man-made ceremony. But it's a sacrament that is made by God himself, one which he sanctifies, and he says that this relationship is to reveal to you the love of Christ for your soul. Therefore, the woman is to see in a man one to whom she can yield herself in a glorious abandonment. She can give herself wholly and completely and find perfect fulfillment and satisfaction in this man because this is the man for her. And that is what he's talking about in Genesis. Spurgeon had something to say about this, and let's listen to him. She delights in her husband, in his person, his character, his affection. To her, he's not only the chief and foremost of mankind, but in her eyes, he's all in all. Her heart's love belongs to him and to him only. He is her little world, her paradise, her choice treasure. She's glad to sink her individuality in his. She seeks no renown for herself. His honor is reflected upon her, and she rejoices in it. She will defend his name with her dying breath. Safe enough is he where she can speak of him. His smiling gratitude is all the reward she seeks. Even in her dress she thinks of him and considers nothing beautiful which is distasteful to him. He has many objects in life, some of which she does not quite understand, but she believes in them all, and anything she can do to promote them she delights to perform. Such a wife as a true spouse realizes the model marriage relation and sets forth what our oneness with the Lord ought to be. How wonderful that is, by the way, and that's the end of the quote. Now, my beloved, that's a marvelous picture of the wife in a real Christian marriage. Now, the man is to see in the woman one he can worship. Somebody says, worship, I mean just that. Worship means that there's something worthy. As someone says, do you really mean worship? I mean exactly that. You will find that worship is respect that is paid to worth. If you go back and read the old marriage ceremonies, you will find that the bridegroom always said, I with my body worship you. That is, he sees in her everything that's worthwhile. He must love her so much that he's willing to die for her. Now, the Bible is very expressive, and I do not know why we should be so reluctant to speak as plainly. If you turn back to the Song of Solomon, you'll see the picture of the bridegroom and what he thinks of his bride. He says, "'Thou art all fair, my love, there's no spot in thee. As the lily among thorns, so is my love among the daughters.'" That's rather expressive, is it not? That's what the bridegroom says. Now, I hear the words of the bride. My beloved is mine, and I'm his. He feedeth among the lilies. 
And that is Song of Solomon 2.16. Now, my friend, you can't go any higher than that. In that moment of supreme and sweet ecstasy, either the wife will carry him to the skies or plunge him down to the depths of hell. Either the husband will place her on a pedestal and say, I worship you because I find no spot in you, or else he'll treat her with brutality. And this happens, he'll kill her love and she'll hate him and become cold and frigid. In counseling, I found that this is one reason that a great many marriages are breaking up. Bacteriologist Rene Dubow of the Rockefeller Institute has made this statement. Will you listen? Aimlessness and lack of fulfillment constitute the most common cause of organic and mental disease in the Western world. In other words, this thing that he's talking about is breaking up many a marriage. A wife becomes dissatisfied and frustrated. She becomes nervous, neurotic, and nagging. The husband settles down to a life of mediocrity. He becomes lonely and either develops into a hand-pecked milk toast or a domineering brute. You'll find both in our society today. Now, let me ask a question. And this is rather personal. Are you the kind of a woman that a man would die for? I'm going to be very frank. If you are just one of these little beetle brains who's merely a sex kitten, making eyes at every boy that comes along, you'll never be the kind of a woman that a man would die for. If you do not have beauty of character, if you do not have nobility of soul, you will be but a flame without heat, a rainbow without color, and a flower without perfume. The Word of God deals with that outward adorning. And do not misunderstand, the Bible does not militate against it. All of us ought to look the best we can, and some of us have our problems. But we should do the best we can with what we have. God intends us to enhance the beauty He's given us. There's no reason for any woman not dressing in style. That's no reason for her not to look the best she possibly can. But God puts the emphasis not on outward adorning, but on the meek and quiet spirit, the inward adorning, which is with God of great price. Listen to Peter. We've had this before. First Peter 3, 3 and 4. Whose adorning let it not be that outward adorning of plaiting the hair, and of wearing of gold or putting on of apparel. But let it be the hidden man of the heart, in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. Now, will you listen? I want to say something to the young man. Are you the kind of a man that a woman would follow to the ends of the earth? You may look like a model for Hart, Schaffner, and Marx, but have no purpose, no ambition, no heart for serving God as a Christian, no capacity for great and deep things, no vision at all. If you are that kind, a woman will not follow you very far. She may go with you down to get the marriage license, but she'll also be going down later to get the divorce. All across our West, there are monuments erected to the pioneer wife and mother. I've referred to this before. And I want to refer to it again. I noticed one that's over here in Colorado. And I found out that the statues are up here in California also. But I've always been impressed by it. It's a statue of a pioneer wife and mother. She's a fine-looking woman, crowned with a sunbonnet. The children are about her, holding on to her long, flowing dress. Four or five of them, by the way. You know, she did not go to the psychiatrist or marriage counselor. You know why she never had to go to the preacher to talk about her marriage breaking up? Because one day a man came to her and said, I'm going west to build a career and home. Will you follow me? And she said, I will. And she learned that this man would stand between her and danger. She had many experiences when he protected her from the menacing Indians of that day. She had no problems about whether he loved her or not, and he did not doubt her loyalty. They loved each other. These are the kind of people who built our country 
It's the other element that's tearing it to pieces today. My lovely country, and I don't like it. I hate to see it happening. I know that someone is saying right now, Preacher, I'm not that kind of a person. I'm no hero. Well, young man, God never said that every girl would fall in love with you. Ninety-nine women may pass you by and see in you only the boy next door who uses that greasy kid stuff. That's all. But let me say to you very seriously, one of these days there will come by a woman who will see in you the knight in shining armor. It's God who gives that highly charged chemistry between a certain man and a certain woman. A young woman may be saying, but I'm not beautiful of face or figure. May I say this to you? God never said that you'd attract every male. Only animals do that. Ninety-nine men will pass you by and seeing you no more than what Kipling described, a rag of bone and a hank of hair. But one of these days there'll come by a man who'll love you if you're the right kind of person. You'll become his inspiration. You and may inspire him to greatness, to write a book, to compose a master piece of poetry or music, to paint a picture, or even to preach a sermon. If you are his inspiration... Do not ignore him. Do not run from him. God may have sent you together for that very purpose. There will come that one. Perhaps you are thinking, Preacher, you're in the realm of theory. What are you talking about? It's idealistic. It sounds good in a storybook, but does not happen in life. You're wrong. It does happen. I think of the story of Matthew Henry. I'm right now looking up here in my study down at radio headquarters at a set of books called Matthew Henry's Commentary. And I want to say this candidly. I don't think I've opened one of those books in years. I used to open them quite a bit. But I've never read anything as dull as Matthew Henry. I have to confess that. But I want to say something about that man, something that I found out that's given me a great respect for him. He may be a boring writer, but I tell you, he had a thrill in life. And I never knew, reading some of his material, that he could ever have been romantic at any time in his life. But when he came to London as a young man, he met a very wealthy girl of the nobility. He fell in love with her, and she loved him. Finally, she went to her father to tell him about it, and the father, trying to discourage her, said, Why, that young man has no background. You do not even know where he came from. She answered, You're right. I do not know where he came from, but I know where he's going, and I want to go with him. And she went. Nathaniel Hawthorne was merely a clerk that anybody would have passed by, working in the customs in New York City until he was fired for inefficiency. He came home and he sank into a chair, discouraged and defeated. His wife came behind him, placed before him pen and paper, and putting her arm about him, said, Now, Nathaniel, you can do what you always wanted to do. You can write. He wrote The House of Seven Gables and The Scarlet Letter and other enduring literature because a wife was his inspiration. This was an eternal love. In one of her last letters, the widow of Nathaniel Hawthorne penned this ineradicable hope, which became an anchor of comfort in her soul's sorrow. Listen to what she wrote now. I have an eternity, thank God, in which to know him more and more, or I should die of despair. He said that when he died. You say, I'm talking about history. I'm talking about fact. Let's go back to the very beginning. I've taken you to Adam and Eve at the beginning of this series, and we'll go back there again. That was a romance. Listen to Paul again. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. You love your wife, she's the other part of you. She's you. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, 
but nourish it and cherish it, even as the law of the church. But we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. You see, Eve was created to be a helpmeet for Adam, a help that is fitted for him, one that would just fit right in, my friend, and she's taken from his side, not molded from the ground as were the animals, but taken from a part of him so that he actually was incomplete until they were together. God fashioned her the loveliest thing in creation, and he brought her to Adam, and she was a help that was fit for him. She compensated for what he lacked. He is not complete in himself. She was made for him, and they became one. Again, I read it. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother to cleave unto his wife. They shall be one flesh. Let me move down in history. I want to take a story that always has thrilled me. It's the story of Abelard and Heloise. When John Lord wrote his great women, he used Heloise as the example of love, marital love. The story concerns a young ecclesiastic by the name of Abelard. He was a brilliant young teacher and preacher in what became the University of Paris. And the canon there had a niece by the name of Heloise, whom he sent to be under Abelard's instruction. She was a remarkable person. He was a remarkable man. You know the story. They fell madly in love. But according to the awful practice of that day, and still is, the marriage of a priest was deemed a lasting disgrace. And when John Lord wrote their story, he gave this introduction which I'd like to share with you. It's almost too beautiful to read in this day. It's like a dew-drenched breeze blowing from a flower-strewn mountain met over the slop bucket and pigsty of our contemporary literature. Here's what he wrote. When Adam and Eve were expelled from paradise, they yet found one flower wherever they wandered, blooming in perpetual beauty, The flower represents a great certitude without which few would be happy, subtle, mysterious, inexplicable, a great boon recognized alike by poets and moralists, pagan and Christian, yet identified not only with happiness but human existence and pertaining to the soul in its highest aspiration, allied with the transient and the mortal, even with the weak and corrupt. It's not immortal in its nature and lofty in its aims, at once a passion, a sentiment, and an inspiration. Now, I won't read the rest of it, but Abelard and Heloise, having fallen in love, were not permitted by the church to marry. Therefore, they were married secretly by a friend of Abelard. He continued to teach. But the secret came out when a servant betrayed them, and she was forced into a nunnery. She was never permitted to visit him, and he was never permitted. He was 20 years older than she was, and when he was dying, he asked that he might be with her, that she might attend him, but it was forbidden. And so he wrote this, "'When it pleased thee, O Lord, and as it pleased thee, thou didst join us, and thou didst separate us. Now what thou hast so mercifully begun, mercifully complete, And after separating us in this world, join us together eternally in heaven. And may I say, friends, that it's my personal belief that if you have a wife that you love or a husband that you love, they are not given in marriage in heaven. You got married down here, but there's no reason in the world why you can't be together throughout eternity. That's something to think about. Friends, verse 17 in chapter 2 is actually where we left off last time. And the first few verses in chapter 3 give the answer to it, that is, God's answer to it. And in verse 17, God says to them, having concluded this section on the social sins, which relate to the family and divorce being the cancer that was gnawing at the vitals of this nation, and it'll destroy any nation. 
and we could not be an exception, I'm sure. Verse 17, God says, "...ye have wearied the Lord with your words, yet ye say, in what way have we wearied him?" Again, may I say, this is this feigned, injured innocence of these people. They pretended ignorance offense. They're offended that God would dare say this of them and because they're so entirely ignorant of their sin. And so the thing is this. They say, in what way have we wearied him? Well, God has an answer. He has an answer to all of our problems. You'll note here that this is the fifth sarcastic question of the people to God's charge of their phony and pseudo-worship. If they were bored with religion, so is God. His reaction is, you make me tired. Yet ye say, wherein have we wearied him? Contemptuously and impudently, they contradict God. God lays it on the line and he tells it as it is. Will you notice what he says here? He says, when ye say... Everyone that doeth evil is good in the sight of the Lord, and he delighteth in them. Or where is the God of judgment or the God of justice? Now, they were the ones that introduced a new morality in their day. You see, there was a new morality in Noah's day. And it's been introduced from time to time. We have a new morality in our day. And it's very similar to that of the past. In fact, it's so much like it that this thing is becoming monotonous in the history of man. Every now and then, he comes up with the idea that he's come up with something new. And that is that each person is to do his thing his own way. No one's to interfere with him. He's to have his liberty and he's to follow Freudian psychology and using... Again, the common colloquialism of the street is to do your thing. That's the important thing. So what they're saying here is this. Where is the God of judgment or the God of justice? And they say that everyone doeth evil is good in the sight of the Lord. And Believe me how they're maligning the character of God. But this is something that arises, frankly, rather frequently in the history of mankind that man says, I see this man over here. He's a big sinner. He's prosperous. He doesn't seem to have any problems or trouble as I have, and I'm trying to serve the Lord. How is that? Why does God permit that sort of thing? He says, I just don't understand it at all. And this is the thing that the psalmist bumped into. David saw that sort of thing. Those about him, well, they were getting by with evil. Those that were not serving God, they were the ones that seemed to prosper the most. And he just doesn't quite understand it, why they are getting by with it, and the righteous are the ones that were suffering. And it disturbed him, and naturally it would, that this should happen. You find David in Psalm 73. I probably ought to turn back and lift out a statement or two. David says in Psalm 73, verse 2, and you find that he repeats this in many Psalms. He says, But as for me, my feet were almost gone. My steps had almost slipped. For I was envious of the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. David says, I looked around me, and he says, the rascals were the ones getting rich. And the rich get richer, and the poor get poorer. And the poor saints of God are the ones that are not prospering at all. May I say to you, that is exactly what these people were saying in the day of Malachi. You see, that produces very quickly a new morality. And I simply mean this, that when they do this sort of thing... Everyone that doeth evil is good in the sight of the Lord. In other words, it's as Isaiah said, the day had come when they will call evil good and good evil. 
And they do that because they look about them and they say, God's doing nothing about this today. Wasn't that the problem of Habakkuk when we studied that little book? He looked about him and saw that they were living in sin and God was doing nothing about it. Therefore, it'll pay you to do evil. Crime does pay and that sort of thing. Well, how about today? Look at these big corporations. Look at what is happening to the poor man, the average man. I don't know about you, but I've actually come to the place when I see the way that government spends money today and the lackadaisical attitude of Washington toward the real problems of the world and of our problems. And the one thing that seems to be important to all, this has no respect to party, that each one is trying to curry favor with the rich and please the powerful today, and the little man is stepped on. Why doesn't God do something about it? It's caused a great many people to follow the same procedure. And so this is the problem that is presented here. And I would say it's rather a real problem. David got an answer to his problem because he went to God. He says in verse 17 of Psalm 73, "...until I went into the sanctuary of God, then understood I therein." You see, you're looking at the immediate present. How about the far-off future? Because that's more important, because the far-off future then is right now the immediate present. And what to us is the immediate present today is not important because it's going to be yesterday and not tomorrow. It's going to be the past tense and not present tense and future tense. Time is slipping through the shuttle, let me tell you, and slipping fast. And so what about the rich today? Well, you can build a new morality, get as much as you can, get it while you can. But you see, you're going to have to answer to God. Now, God gives them the answer. They ask the question, where is the God of justice? Well, he has a plan and program. After all, I think that we ought to be very careful about sitting in judgment, as these people did on the situation today. I remember several years ago, I was with a seminary student, and I was a seminary student. We picked up a hitchhiker. That is in the days when you can. And believe me, he smelt like a still. It just come out of Kentucky. You never smelt such a breath of alcohol. And he apologized for it and said he knew that he shouldn't drink and all that. We attempted to witness to him. And my friend that was there said a very startling thing to me then, but I totally concur with it today. And this is the thing that he said to him. He said, we're not condemning you for getting drunk. <laughs> That's all right. You're a lost man on the way to hell. So you better squeeze the orange of this life all you can and get all the juice out of it while you're here, brother, because you won't be squeezing an orange. You won't have this liquor when you get over there. So go ahead and live it up. But you're moving into eternity. Did you ever stop to think about that? Well, that's the same thing that you have here. God says, you think I'm not doing anything about it? Where's the God of justice? Like that man that was not even deceived by his pastor when the pastor told him that he was going to heaven because he was a good man. Well, that man's a good man, and this daughter of his is kind enough to compare me to him And I don't think that I'd compare to him at all in any way whatsoever. But if he was like I am, then I can say this. He knows in his heart he was a sinner. And when he came to Christ, he knew that he needed a Savior. And that is the thing that is important. Where's the God of justice? That's a question that any unsaved person better ask himself. I'll be very frank with you. He's not going to move. When I was a kid in southern Oklahoma... We used to swipe watermelons. And I'll be honest with you, every time I went in a watermelon patch to swipe a watermelon, I thought that there'd be lightning out of heaven that would strike me dead. But I was going to steal those watermelons regardless because that's the willfulness of the human heart, even of a little boy. But I thought God had judged me. May I say to you, I don't think that the Lord moves quite like that. 
although we see instances of it when judgment against an evil work is not executed speedily. And because of that, the writer of the proverb says, the hearts of man just continue to go on in wickedness. They say, I got by with it. I'll keep on getting by with it. 